sorry. All right, so our, our next speaker uh, coming to us is Dennis Locke. Dennis is, expects to receive his PhD in statistics from Iowa State uh, coming up in August 2014 with a focus actually in statistics and sports, so it's a good thing he's here. Uh, he has particularly an interest in player ratings and with probability, win probability that is, and has conducted uh, or is currently conducting research in all forms of major sports, hockey, football, basketball, and uh, even volleyball. Uh, more information is available at uh, his website, which I'm sure he'll introduce. So uh, let's welcome Dennis as I get the actual talk up. That good? Yeah. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And I uh, noticed he said the major sports, but he actually left out one of the major sports, that being baseball. So I actually don't spend much time in baseball just because it seems like there's so many other statisticians already in baseball that it's a bit of an overloaded subject. But anyway, so my, the product I'm going to present on today is a using random forest to estimate win probability before each play of an NFL football game. Can I get this to go? Yeah. So the project idea is really at any specific moment of a game, we want to find the probability that a particular team is ultimately going to go on to win that game. So the example I have here is the probability a team is receiving the ball on the 20 yard line, they're down by three with two minutes remaining, what's the probability they end up actually going on to win that game? So what we're doing, how we're attempting to estimate this, is uh, combining prepay variables uh, in order to estimate this win probability really at any moment in an NFL game using a random forest methodology. So we also want to essentially demonstrate the use of WP estimates. So assuming we can get a good estimate of wind probability, how can this be useful? And there's just a general fan interest. You can plot the course of a game using wind probabilities. That's sometimes cool to look at. Um, there's real-time wind probability estimation. You're watching a game. You want to know what's the probability either team's going to win. But also we think this can be used to evaluate plays and play calling decisions. And one of the examples I like, it's nice and recent, is from this most recent Super Bowl. Uh, the Baltimore Ravens chose to take an intentional safety late in the game. And so we're going to look at, was that actually a good decision? Did their win probability increase when they took, increase when they took this safety? All right, so a lot of the motivation for this project came from uh, Brian Burke and his website, advancednflstats.com. And I guess in this audience, a lot of people have looked at this, but if you like NFL statistics and haven't gotten a chance, I recommend taking a look at that. It's pretty cool. And one of the statistics he, work on, he works on there is wind probability. And so what we wanted to do is essentially develop an alternative to Brian Burke's wind probability. You might say, why? I mean, essentially, a large portion of his wind probability is subjectively binning the variables. And we think it could be beneficial to bin variables like seconds and yard line, things like this in a more objective way rather than just subjectively uh, uh, deciding those partitions. We also look to include information measuring the quality of both teams competing. Because I think anyone who knows much about football will tell you in most games, both teams don't have a 50% chance of winning at the start of the game. And third one, we want to develop a method that can be easily repeated on a new set of variables. And this is especially for a different sport. So it'd be nice if we could get kind of a common way we could estimate win probability in a bunch of, in at least the, the major sports. So the data we have, so recently, since 2000, the, the NFL began releasing this play-by-play -play data. For the, they release it from all games, both regular and postseason. So we're going to use all the seasons from 2001 to 2012 with setting aside 2012 as, as the test data set, such that we have 2001 through 2011 as our training data. And you can see there where I actually downloaded the raw play-by-play -play data. Um, it was free until about three months ago, and now I think it costs something like $15. I guess they realized they could make some money off it. And so in this data set, an observational unit is any pre-play situation. So example being first and 10 on the 20 yard line, down by three with two minutes remaining. And it's observed with respect to the offensive team. So for instance, the value of score difference of negative three, that implies the team currently with the ball is losing by three. 
And this all implies that we're estimating win probability for the offensive team. So of course, we can get the defensive team just by taking one minus that estimate. So we have our observational unit. We need our variables. So we have our binary response variables. This is just an indicator variable as to whether or not the offensive team won. So if the team cur currently with the ball goes on to win the game, it's a 1. If they didn't, it's a 0. And then we have this set of predictive variables. Uh, down, the yards to go for the first down, a field position, the seconds remaining, the score difference. An adjusted score difference, which is a score difference adjusted for the amount of time remaining in the game. The total points scored, because it might matter if it's a real high scoring affair, if it's a real low scoring affair. Uh, the timeouts remaining, and the Las Vegas point spread. So we actually ended up only using the Vegas point spread as the singular measure of the quality of the difference in quality between the two teams. We tried all sorts of other, t other things, like which team is home, the current records, the yards gained per game, things like that. But none of them showed any kind of importance in the model. It really just showed that essentially the spread is supposed to account for all these things. So there was no reason to include more variables to, to measure the team's qualities. So a very brief, maybe too brief, what is a random forest? So essentially, it's a combination of either classification or regression trees. And I have a, a tree is effectively a nearest neighbor's method of binning observations on values of the predictive variables in order to maximize within bin homogeneity of the training response. So this is essentially what we're looking for in the idea of an objective way to bin the predictive variables in a way that could hopefully maximize prediction. I note here that we chose to use a random forest of regression trees. And what a regression tree does is it takes the average of the response values in a resulting bin as a predicted response for future observations in that bin. So for a single tree, we have this average. And then to get the entire forest, we take an average of the predicted values from all the trees that we grow in that forest. But there's no use growing a whole bunch of different trees if it's just going to produce the same tree over and over again. So each tree of the forest has two adjustments in order to grow a nice variety. Each one is grown on a bootstrapped version of the original sample. And that each split of the training observations, only a subset of the variables are considered as candidates for deciding the splitting rules. Maybe we'll only look at two, two variables at one point in order to decide a split, rather than looking at all 10. This is a, as I said, maybe too brief, what's a random forest? So now I'll get into more of a why we chose the random forest. So a first one, it allows for complex and unknown interactions between predictive variables. So chances are predictive variables interact a whole lot. But we really don't know why. And the example I have is score difference in time remaining. We know there's definitely some interaction there. Leading by three at a minute into the game is much different than leading by three with a minute left in the game. And the random forest can account for these interactions without us having to specifically tell, that, tell it what these interactions are. And a second why is predictions are entirely on empirical evidence. This leads to minimal dangerous assumptions. I originally had no dangerous assumptions there. But saying no dangerous assumptions is a dangerous assumption in itself. <laughs> <laughs> so I put it to minimal. It also nicely handles outliers. You see these blowout victories really aren't overly influential. It also is easy to obtain variable importance measurements. And possibly most important of all, it's very good predictability. I mo pretty much all papers you see about the random forest just rave about how remarkable its predictability is. So on to the actual results. So it's tough to measure performance when you're looking at this in-game win probability. So you can think about like the general, general measurements of performance we usually look at, right? Your mean absolute error, mean squared error, things like that. So here I have the, the mean absolute error by quarter. You can say, as expected, it gets less and less as we go on, because we're coming closer and closer to the final conclusion. But like, what does? See, about 0.2 mean absolute error in the fourth quarter. But I mean, say it's five minutes remaining in the fourth quarter, and we say a team has an 80% chance of winning the game, and they go on to win that game. Was that 80% probability a bad probability, even though it was 0.2 off of what the actual response was? I mean, it's possible 
that the wind probability at that time was actually exactly 0.8. Well, it could have been exactly 0.5, and it looks like a bad prediction because it has to go to 0 or 1 by the end. So we're looking for an alternative way to, to measure performance. So what we decided here is we took the entire set of observations in the test set, predicted the wind probability, and then binned it into 5% bins. So for instance, if we, if we estimate the wind probability of 75%, we'd expect about 75% of the time that team's going to go on to win the game. So we have this 75 to 80% bin, and then we look at the proportion of the time the game was won for all the observations that lie in that bin. And so you could essentially see the black line would be if it's completely, if it's perfect, if it's the proportion of games corresponds exactly to what we would expect given our estimated win probability. So you can see in general, it appears to be estimating win probability pretty well, maybe a little underestimated at around the 20 and 30% range, but in general, all the points fall real, like, pretty close to this line. And in fact, this is actually the only one that falls outside of its, its correct bin. So hopefully I've convinced you that it's at least a pretty good estimate of win probability. Now let's look at some of the things we can get from these estimated win probabilities. So this is uh, Super Bowl 47, between the, uh, the most recent Super Bowl between the Ravens and the 49ers. And I've outlined a few plays here. Uh, first play, play 14. That was the first touchdown of the game. The Ravens were leading 7 nothing at that point. And so this is, I apologize, this is the win probability for the Baltimore Ravens for every play throughout that game. So that was the first lead of the game for the Ravens, and their win probability was nicely up above 50%. And then things just kept going better and better for them. At this point, they returned the second half kickoff. They were leading by 28 to 6. So it looked like they were, in, they were in really good shape. They were rolling. They had this win probability well up above 90%. Everything looks great. And then the lights went out. And the, the 49ers scored two quick touchdowns and, and got the ball back right here. So that was the, uh, a score difference of only eight. And then they kind of bounced around for a while, uh, trading field goals till they get to this, the second red line. And at that point, it's a first and goal on the seven yard line, two minutes and 39 seconds remaining in the game, and the 49ers are down five, and it's a 52% win probability. So what I'm gonna do now is kind of like go through the end of that game, showing you how, how, this, will, how this figure essentially develops. So it's first play, they get a two yard gain, it really doesn't change much, second and goal, five yard line, two minutes remaining. Then an incomplete pass, you can see that's good for the Ravens, only two more chances to get a touchdown. Another incomplete pass, so now it's a fourth, a fourth and goal on the five yard line. They have one last shot and they, they fail to convert. So the turnover on downs, you can see a huge jump in win probability. The Ravens have the ball back, less than two minutes remaining. And the Ravens run the ball three straight times. And even though none of these runs are successful at all, they gained three yards on three runs, you still see the win probability increasing just because the time is going down so much while they're, while they're running the ball. And then they chose to take it in safety. So you can see, but even though they gave up those two points, so now it's 34-31, they actually gained win probability because the safety punt is punting from a much better position than they would have been punting from inside their own end zone. And then the game ends. So by taking that intentional safety, the Baltimore Ravens increased the WP from 91.8% to 94.2%. So that's quite the jump. I mean, this took no skill at all. And if you're watching the game, all they did was hike the ball around. The punter ran around a little bit goofily and then just stepped out of the back of the end zone. So we can use these change in wind probability, or delta WP, to assess essentially play calling decisions. And another example here I have is by kicking a surprise onside kick successfully in Super Bowl 44, the Saints increased their wind probability by 7%. So you might say, well, of course they did. They did it successfully. If they had done it unsuccessfully, they probably would have decreased their win probability. <laughs> so we need something else here. So we can actually look at the average, win, average change in win probability from plays of a similar nature. So for instance, here, the average change in win probability for 
all surprise onside kicks from the last 12 years, and that means an onside kick not in the fourth quarter. So in the fourth quarter, you might expect it, but you usually won't expect an onside kick before the fourth quarter. And this average increase in win probability was actually at about 2%. So on average, attempting an onside kick, surprisingly, seems to increase win probability. But of course, if you attempt enough onside kicks to get to the average, you'd probably lose the surprise part that's on there. And so these are just a couple examples, but really this change in wind probability and average, win, and average change in wind probability could be used to make real-time decisions on plays. And I like such as fourth down decisions is another example where this could, be, this could be really useful. And so I'll illustrate my uh, next couple of points with my personal favorite Super Bowl, although it might not be a very popular Super Bowl here. <laughs> So this was the, the New York Giants against the, at the time, undefeated New England Patriots. And you can see the, 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 the spread of this game was 13 and a half. It was the largest spread in a, in a Super Bowl history. So you can see at the start of the game, the Giants really only had about a 25% chance of winning that game, which is actually higher than I think I would have given them at the start of that game. You can see how that spread had, has a pretty strong impact, because the Giants really didn't have much chance of winning that game at the beginning. I've highlighted the, all, the, all four touchdowns of the game, but in the interest of time, I think I'll skip over those and go to the, the next point. So the, the big play of this game was, uh, was David Tyree's, the famous helmet catch, where he caught the ball on his helmet, and it was a remarkable play. And everyone talks about this. Fox Sports rated it the, the greatest Super Bowl play in history. And this changed win probability by 12%. So this was, I mean, this was pretty influential on the game. A 12% change in win probability is pretty huge. But actually, four plays later, the Plaxico Burris touchdown catch on third and 10 changed win probability by 39%. So if you wanted to look at what was actually the most influential play of this game, it was actually the, the touchdown catch to Plaxico Burris, not the David Tyree helmet catch that gets all the press. So in this way, we can judge the most influential plays from a set of plays essentially using change in win probabilities. So we could do it by a season, by a game. Uh, this bullet here, I, drew, I looked at all of the Super Bowl plays of the last 12 years. And the best play was James Harrison's 100-yard interception return before halftime in 2008, which increased win probability by 51% for the Steelers. Uh, the best play of the 2012 season was a 39-yard catch by Cecil Shorts, down five with 20 seconds remaining. So this changed win probability by 71%. It looked like they were going to lose, and suddenly they were going to win. Actually, interesting, interestingly, the second best play of last season was the, uh, the famous referee debacle in the Seattle Green Bay game. That catch was rated the second best play of the season if you go by the change in win probability. So quickly through future considerations, there's this feature of the data that the random force doesn't account for, and that's that each game has approximately 150 sequential observations that are all predicting one response value, so 150 plays all predicting just one or lost. So are these, inter are these independent observations? Definitely not. Are these stochastic observations? Maybe not. It depends whether you believe in momentum, that it matters where you've come from to got to the point. So we have attempted many methods to account for these possible problems, but none appear to improve performance, so we've uh, essentially stuck with the regular random forest method. And the uh, most interesting future consideration, in my opinion, is looking at other sports. I'm extending this to essentially the easiest in pre-play situations, like sports like basketball and baseball, where you've got a possession or a pitch. I've actually already started working on this in basketball. It may be more of a challenge in the flow sports, such as soccer and hockey. And so I guess the two takeaways I'd like you to get, if you get any takeaways from this, is that the random forest is a fairly simple and actually quite effective way of estimating wind probability, and that these estimated wind probabilities can have many uses. I'm stealing this quote from Brian Burke at JSM, that any sport, wind probability is basically the holy grail of analytics. Thank you. We do have time for a couple questions, so let's just start down here. Where would you uh, recommend someone would go to for a good introduction on random 
Tibetan forests. It sounds like a really cool tool. Um, the Hasty Tipshirani and Freeman book What's on the, machine the, learning. If you could just. Oh, yeah, sorry. A uh, hasty tip, Shirani and Freeman. I'm not positive actually what the name is, truthfully. Is that it? And Leo Bryman's paper in 2001 is also very good. That's where he introduced the, co the, the concept. But that's more theoretical and less applications. Question in the back? Yeah, so um, did you treat each score differential differently? What I mean is, in football, I'm going to challenge that every score differential. Right, so the random forest would look for splits essentially in between two integer values. So it would try to split between negative three and negative four if it deems there's a big difference between those two score differences. Okay. Yep. So that'll automatically come out? So that'll automatically come out with the random forest procedure, yep. I did, yeah. I actually looked at, looked at seasons to see if the wind probability was mattered at all based on what season we looked at. And I didn't see anything like that that, that showed that kind of trend. But I'm not sure. All right. Well, let's thank the speaker.